As one of the world's most famous and iconic families, the British royal family is subject to a wide range of traditions and protocols that have been in place for centuries. From dress codes to mealtime etiquette, the royal family's daily routines are steeped in history and tradition. Join us as we explore some of the most surprising and fascinating rules that govern the lives of the King, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, and other members of the royal family. So, without further ado, let's dive into the world of royal pro protocol and discover the secrets behind the British monarchy. 20 strict rules the royal family must follow. Number 20. The Royal Wedding Dresses There are many rules involving a royal wedding. For starters, the Royal Marriages Act of 1772 requires all members of the royal family to obtain permission from the reigning monarch to be able to marry, which means that long before there was even a small hint of getting down on one knee, the queen had to approve the proposal plans. Then, the bride-to-be needs to take quite intense training courses in what it is to be a royal, everything from how to greet people to SAS training for their own safety. But what about the central piece in any marriage, the wedding dress? Well, the queen not only had to approve it first, but she was one of the very few people that could see it before the wedding. In fact, Her Majesty had to eye the dress before work even took place on the gown. And the dress needs to follow many rules, like no short hemlines, no low necklines, and no shoulder on display. There are also rules about the tiara. It is tradition that tiaras are only worn by married women and their wedding day is the first time they get to sport one, so it's a very important choice to make. The queen had a 150-foot-long basement vault with her jewelry collection from where the bride could choose, but it's rumored that Her Majesty whittled down the selection, limiting the choice for the bride-to-be. Now it's time for the odd topic. All women in the royal family are expected to adhere to strict posture rules. They are expected to sit with their back straight and both feet flat on the ground. Additionally, they must keep their hands in their lap with their right hand over their left and never cross their legs or ankles. Knees and ankles must be tightly together and legs must be slanted to the side. These rules help to protect an image of dignity and grace that befits the monarch. Also, the royal family is expected to display a certain level of decorum in public, and this extends to their approach to showing affection. Displays of public affection, such as holding hands or kissing, are generally discouraged, with the exception of weddings and other formal events. This is to maintain a sense of professionalism and to avoid any potential distractions from the business of representing the country. As always, let us know your thoughts in the comment section down below using the hashtag OddTopic. Number 19. Royal family members must always pack an all-black outfit when they travel. Now, that sounds ominous, doesn't it? When usually people always pack a dressy outfit just in case something amazing happens during their holidays and they're invited to a fancy party, the royals have the protocol to prepare for an eventual death. Not as fun, huh? Unfortunately, one never expects a death to occur, but they do nonetheless, and the royal mourning protocol is perhaps one of the strictest ones, out of respect for the deceased. The death of Queen Elizabeth II has reacquainted us with the traditions in such cases. There are rules for absolutely everything, and wardrobe rules apply to every single member of the royal family. That is why they are required to carry an all-black outfit with them at all times when traveling. That's, of course, fit for a funeral and not a night out on the town. This rule started when Queen Elizabeth II learned about her father's passing in 1952. She was away visiting Kenya with her husband, Prince Phillips. At the time, she didn't have a black dress in her luggage, so she had to arrange a black outfit on the way back to London. This is why she made it a rule to always be prepared for such occasions. Number 18. Shellfish and garlic are to be avoided in all formal meals. Imagine sitting at the dinner table with Her Majesty the Queen surrounded by very important people having a wonderful time when all of a sudden one guest opens their mouth to talk to you and out goes a pungent garlic stench. 
that wouldn't be very pleasing, would it? It would kind of destroy the magical moment, and Queen Elizabeth II probably knew that very well. That's why royals have to follow a very strict protocol when it comes to what they can and can't eat in the palace or on royal duty. The queen herself, not being a very big fan of messy foods like bolognese, made it so that all palace meals had to be approved by her. Here's a list of the things the royals have to stay clear of. Shellfish while dining out or visiting foreign countries is a no-no. This is due to the danger of getting food poisoning. Foie gras is also to be avoided, as it's one of the most controversial foods out there because of the mistreatment of animals in its making process. Rare meat, also because of the potential bacteria. Royals can't be seen to be sick when out in public. They're also not to eat too spicy or exotic food. There's a risk they won't like it or it might make them ill, which would be a disaster when visiting a foreign country that proudly served them that dish. Number 17. Royal staff members are not allowed to reprimand the queen's dogs. This rule should go for all dogs. Nobody other than their owners should be allowed to reprimand them. Jokes aside, this is a real rule that the royal staff need to follow to the T. The special treatment the queen reserved to her dogs is believed to have persisted over the years since she was first presented with her very first pet as a special gift from her parents for her 18th birthday. She's always treated the cute little corgis as members of the family, and seeing as hers is a royal family, the pets must be treated accordingly. The pooches sleep in the corgi room and are looked after by two footmen called Doggy One and Doggy Two. The sheets in the dog's baskets are refreshed every day. But that's not all. These dogs live better than most people. They're served fresh gourmet food for their dinner and, hold on to your hats, they have their own chef in the Buckingham Palace kitchen. The queen lets her dogs roam freely around the palace, and even if they do something wrong, the staff cannot scold them. It was no secret that Her Majesty was a passionate dog lover. At the time of her passing, she had three dogs, two corgis and a dorgie, which is a combination of a dachshund and a corgi. In fact, the queen is credited with creating the new breed. Number 16. Women should refrain from wearing wedge shoes in the Queen's presence. When normal people don't like a fashion item or style, they simply stop wearing it. But when the Queen disliked something, well, that was a different story. Famously, Her Majesty disliked wedge shoes, so no woman in the royal family was allowed to wear them in her presence. A little too strict, isn't it? Well, that was just how things were. In fact, you'll not find one picture of Meghan Markle or Kate Middleton wearing wedges around the Queen. But even though the Duchess of Sussex nor the Duchess of Cambridge will dare face Her Majesty's sporting wedges, Kate has been seen wearing them to official engagements without the Queen present. Meghan, on the other hand, hasn't been spotted wearing them since she joined the royal family in May 2018. Although this is an unofficial rule, it's something of a precedent set by the Queen herself for the rest of the royal family. So now you know, if you can't imagine living the rest of your life without wedged shoes, you are not cut out to join the royal family. It's very simple, it's the shoes or becoming a royal. That choice should come very easily to most people. Number 15. When the queen finishes eating, everyone else must be done as well. Eating at the queen's dinner table must have been quite the experience. Imagine the type of stories she could bring to the table. But anyone lucky enough to feast with Her Majesty had to follow two extremely important rules. Rule number one, don't sit down before the queen does. Even during massive receptions of hundreds of people, everybody had to follow Her Majesty's lead when it came to approaching the table. Nobody, and I mean nobody, was allowed to sit down before she was settled into her seat. Rule number two, you are only allowed to eat while Her Majesty is eating. 
seeing as everyone must follow the monarch's cue, that also applies to starting and finishing a meal. When she started eating, then and only then could you take your first bite. But if you happen to be very hungry, you'd have to eat rather fast, because the instant the queen was done with her meal, nobody else was allowed to keep eating. Now, these rules may seem a little bit outdated. Maybe that's why if someone didn't follow the protocol, she didn't get too offended. In fact, there are many rules that the queen herself broke during her reign. She once took a zip of her finger bolt to make a foreign prince feel less uncomfortable as he had confused his for a dessert plate. Number 14. Royals must wear natural hair, makeup, and nail colors. Seeing as they are constantly in the international public eye and they represent the English crown wherever they go, it is a must that members of the royal family have to follow a certain dress code. There are a lot of very high standards that have been set before the current royal family, standards that they must follow to the T. Specifically, there are quite a number of rules that they have to follow that are seriously specific and pretty hard to adhere to. When it comes to makeup, hair, and nails, the rules are quite intense. Lots of people nowadays like to express themselves with colorful finger and toenails, but not the royals. Fake and colored nails are deemed vulgar by the royal family and therefore are banned. It's also understood that they shouldn't go too crazy with their hair either. You'll never see Meghan or Kate rocking a bright blue mane with neon feathers. In fact, their hair must always look effortlessly and naturally beautiful, as per the rule. When it comes to makeup, following the same theme as the other rules, they must keep it neutral and classy. Think whatever the Kardashians wouldn't do. That's the royals' makeup routine. Apparently, they're completely forbidden from touching up their makeup in public, too, but they always have to look perfectly well put. Life as a royal isn't as easy as it sounds. Number 13. Royal Wedding Bouquets Must Contain the Myrtle Plant For every bride, choosing the perfect wedding bouquet can be a colossal task. Everything must be perfect. Color, texture, shape, and seasonality all have to be taken into account. Not to mention that many brides often choose flowers with special meaning to them. Now, myrtle may look like a very simple plant, not one worthy of the most powerful royal families in the entire world, but in fact, this unassuming plant is a royal favorite for wedding bouquets and many more important flower arrangements. Myrtus communis, simply called myrtle, has been a crucial component of the crown's signature aesthetic for a long time. Meghan Markle's wedding bouquet included myrtle from Queen Victoria's own garden. Yeah, that's right. Queen Elizabeth's great-great-grandmother. This myrtle plant has been tended for over 170 years since she decided to grow a plant from the myrtle used in her own wedding bouquet. Since Queen Victoria, every royal bride has carried myrtle from this same plant. This means that from Queen Victoria to Meghan Markle, every single royal bride had myrtle sprigs from stems planted at Osborne House on the Isle of Wight by Queen Victoria in 1845, and from a plant grown from the myrtle used in the Queen's wedding bouquet in 1947. That's such a beautiful tradition. Number 12. The Queen Picks the Tiara Worn by the Bride in a Royal Wedding in the collective mind, tiaras are a more whimsical accessory rather than a historical artifact, unlike a crown, for instance. The only tiara rules that most people are aware of is, one, you put it on, and two, you sparkle fabulously. But just like for dinner, corgis, or dress codes, there are also quite a few rules involving tiaras and the royal family. As we said earlier in this video, tiaras are only to be worn by married women in the royal family, which makes the process of choosing a wedding tiara all the more special. Whether they are blood princesses or marrying into the royal family, it's understood that they get to wear a tiara for the first time on their big day. However, in England, the head of the state is able to pick a royal bride's tiara. It is known that Her Majesty denied Meghan Markle's first choice tiara because it was rumored to have come from Russia. 
It's believed that when Prince Harry learned about this, he flew into a rage. Tiaras can only be worn after 5 p.m., except for weddings. They are loaned to one person for their entire lifetime. It becomes their signature look, if you will. Have you ever noticed that once a royal wears a tiara, no one else wears it afterwards? Well, now you know why. Number 11. Six Ravens Must Live at the Tower of London at All Times Most people think of ill omens when they think of ravens. These mysterious and enigmatic birds have been surrounded by legends and myths for centuries, and especially the ones residing at the magnificent Tower of London. It's not known when the ravens first came to the tower, but it's believed that the future of both country and kingdom relies upon their continued residence there. Legend has it that if there aren't exactly six, not seven and not five, but six ravens living there, then both the tower and the monarchy will fall. The first royal observatory was installed in the northeastern turret of the White Tower. According to legend, John Flamsteed, a 17th century astronomer and the first astronomer royal, complained to King Charles II that the ravens were interfering with his work. The king, very fond of Flamsteed's work, ordered the destruction of the birds, only to be told that if the ravens left the tower, the White Tower would fall and a horrific disaster would befall upon his kingdom. Naturally, the king changed his mind and, just in case, you know, as a preventative measure, he decreed that at least six ravens must be kept at the tower at all times. Today, these are very spoiled ravens. They have a raven master to look after them, and they are checked by expert vets regularly. Number 10. They must accept every gift gracefully. When you're a royal, gifts are pretty much thrown at you from all sides. But no matter what that gift may be, if a luxurious car or a chicken, they must always accept the presents the same way, gracefully, graciously, and with class. And even when they are gifted so much, it doesn't really matter, because the queen gets to decide who gets to keep what. Oh, and there's a second catch. According to the British Royal Guidelines, gifts offered by private individuals living in the UK not personally known to the member of the royal family should be refused where there are concerns about the propriety or motives of the donor of the gift itself. For example, when Harry and Meghan got married, a lot of fans sent them gifts, but they had to return all of them. It was almost $9 million worth of presents. Number 9. The game Monopoly is banned from the royal household. Many families have had many a fight over a game of Monopoly, some more aggressive than others, I'm sure. But not the royals. To avoid any type of dramatic situation, the queen had banned them from playing Monopoly altogether. Talk about solving a problem by its roots. She claimed the game can get too vicious. And, I mean, she wasn't wrong. It was Prince Andrew who let this royal secret slip back in 2008 while on a visit to Leeds Building Society's newly refurbished Albion Street headquarters. Before leaving, the Duke of York was presented with a property board game, Monopoly, as a gift to mark his visit, but unfortunately, he had to politely decline. He simply said, we are not allowed to play Monopoly at home. <laughs> And while us peasants can't really relate to much of the royal protocol and lifestyle, this is certainly one rule many of us can understand perfectly well. A dispute in a normal family can usually be settled with a hug and an apology, but how do you think royal families settle their disagreements? That's how wars start. Number 8. Prince Philip was required to walk behind the Queen. Royal protocol is there for a reason, sure, but it can get weird sometimes. Prince Philip was famously required to walk two steps behind his wife, Queen Elizabeth II, when they were in public. Now, this is a rule that makes a certain sense. She's the reigning monarch, and she must be walking up front as a sign of respect. 
In other words, there's a very specific orders of preference, as they're called. The royal family is part of a procession. They enter rooms, are seated, and walk in the order of precedence, which is basically the same order as the line of succession to the throne. As you can very well imagine, it would be unthinkable for a prince to walk in front of a queen, and the royal couple were no exception. Queen Elizabeth II sat at the top of the royal family's hierarchy. Therefore, she walked in front, always. Okay, so, so far so good, but what happens when this leads to Prince Philip's head and that of Her Majesty to be on different sides of a theatrical curtain? Well, that is exactly what happened when the couple stood as they listened to the national anthem in Salisbury on June 13th, 2017. As you can see, this comical scene really did take place, but the rules are the rules, so the Duke of Edinburgh had to stand there with his face covered until they all sat down again. Number 7. No Politics Allowed if you visit the official website of the monarchy, it says right there in black and white, or in this case, blue and white, that as head of state, the queen has to remain strictly neutral with respect to political matters, unable to vote or stand for election. However, Her Majesty does have important ceremonial and formal rules in the government of the UK. It is not prohibited by law for the monarch to vote in an election, but it is considered unconstitutional. Think about it. Prime ministers change roughly every five Five years if everything goes to plan, and every time there's an election, a prime minister from opposing political parties may be elected. If the reigning monarch was to publicly endorse or criticize one or another, it would create unnecessary chaos. So does this rule apply to every other member of the royal family? Mostly, yes. Well, sort of. Meghan and Kate had to stop any political affiliations and activities the day they married into the royal family and neither Prince William nor Prince Andrew have ever declared their political preferences. They're not bound by any written law, but they would be heavily criticized if they did so, no matter which side they support. Number 6. Women in the family must learn to sit like a proper royal. If I asked you to sit like a royal, what would you do? If you can't find an answer, don't worry. Sitting like a royal does not come naturally, not even to members of the royal family. That's why they have to go through courses and training to get it just right, and the rules are very different for men and women. For instance, as far as etiquette rules go, one of the absolute worst things a woman in the royal family can do is sit with her legs crossed at the knee. Legs and knees must be kept together at all costs, although crossing at the ankle is perfectly fine. There aren't many different ways you can sit while following this rule, but nevertheless, the Duchess of Cambridge, Kate Middleton, has managed to create her own signature pose. They call it the Duchess Slant, and it is her go-to sitting position, which involves keeping her knees and ankles tightly together and slanting her legs to the side. This position allows her to keep her posture graceful and modest while making her legs appear longer. In fact, the late Princess Diana was also known to sit in this exact same way. Number 5. Royal Family Members Must Enter a Room or Meeting in Order as we mentioned earlier in this video, there are very strict rules that every royal family member has to adhere to if they want to still remain in the family, and that is the orders of preference, which is essentially the order of who's next in line to the throne. When the Queen and Prince Philip were alive, the order was first Queen Elizabeth II as the reigning monarch and the head of the family, then followed by her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, also known as Prince Philip and Her Majesty's husband, then came the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall, formerly known as Prince Charles and his wife Camilla, but that are now to be referred to as King Charles III and Queen Camilla Consort, followed by the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, which are more commonly known as Prince William and Kate Middleton. I think you can get quite consumed by a relationship when you're younger. And, and next are the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, famously known as Prince Harry and Meghan Merkel. Prince Harry is the fifth in line of succession to the British throne, which means he most likely won't ever become king. But then again, neither did his grandmother, and she became the longest reigning monarch in history. Number 4. No Autographs Allowed 
The Royals are sometimes referred to as the firm. This term was coined by King George in a statement where he said that he and the rest of the Royals were not a family, we're a firm. He probably referred to the fact that they can't function like a normal, traditional family, seeing all the obligations and rules they have, which stretch into every crevice of their personal and professional lives. One such rule is that they are never, under any circumstance, allowed to sign autographs. If you're a Royal fan, you've probably noticed Noticed they never stop to sign autographs for their fans like celebrities and athletes do. As much as this rule may seem insignificant, it's actually one of the most important commands the royal family has ever put in place. The reason for this rule goes beyond etiquette. The royal family is arguably the world's most famous family, and their role goes far beyond just public appearances. The reigning monarch is the head of state of the Commonwealth. If one of the royals signed an autograph and someone forged their signature, imagine the international and political chaos that could ensue. It could be a worldwide disaster, and it would have all started with a simple and innocent autograph. Number 3 Never touch the monarch's accessories. Queen Elizabeth II was rarely seen out in public without one of her signature lawner handbags. According to some sources, she owned more than 200 of them. But the Queen's handbags weren't just for looks, although she did look fabulous with them. Her handbags were used to send nonverbal signals to her staff. These subtle signals helped her to get out of uncomfortable conversations at any time she pleased. For example, if the handbag was on one part of her arm, it meant that the conversation was going fine, so they were to leave Her Majesty alone. But on the other hand, if the handbag was moved a little bit lower on her arm, it meant they had to approach the monarch and make up an excuse to get her out of the situation immediately. Pretty genius, huh? A simple handbag turned into an instrument of sending secret messages. This is the number one reason why nobody was ever allowed to touch the queen's accessories. Imagine the awkwardness if someone touched her handbag by mistake, triggering a whole secret staff operation. Now, that would be funny to watch. But in any case, this is how important accessories truly are. Not being able to wear handbags, I wonder what King Charles III is going to use for the same purpose. Number 2. Family members may only get engaged or married with prior approval from the Queen. It shouldn't come as a surprise, after all the things that have happened recently with Meghan Markle and Prince Harry, that the Queen had the power to approve or disapprove of anyone marrying into the royal family. It all started in 1772, when Parliament passed an act imposing strict conditions on how members of the royal British family may contract a valid marriage. The act clearly states that no descendant of George II can marry without the consent of the reigning monarch. This act, although quite harsh, is still valid today. Since its creation, more than a hundred marriages have had to be approved by the reigning monarch. No marriage has occurred without the approval. The most famous example of this involved the Queen's own sister, Princess Margaret. She fell in love in the early 1950s with Peter Townsend, a married RAF officer in the royal household. In 1952, the king died, and Elizabeth became queen. Townsend divorced his wife and proposed to Margaret early in the following year. However, due to the 1772 Royal Marriages Act, Margaret needed the queen's permission to marry. But seeing as Townsend was a divorced man and the Church of England had strict rules about remarriage after divorce at the time, the queen did not grant Margaret's request. To make things worse, the queen sent Townsend to Belgium for two years to keep the pair from having an affair. The two sisters' relationship never fully recovered from that. Number 1. Everyone Must Address the Queen Correctly Yep, you guessed it. The rules and protocols do not only involve the royal family, but anyone around them as well. If you were to ever address the queen, you would have to use the correct formal address, which is your majesty, and every time after that, she should be addressed as ma'am, only pronounced with a short a, like in jam. As for the traditional form, for men, this is a neck bow from the head only, whilst women have to do a small curtsy. But some people prefer to simply shake hands the usual way, depending on their 
their own preference. It isn't clear what would happen if someone would disobey these rules, but they would probably never get to see any member of the royal family ever again. As for other titled members of the royal family, the first address is Your Royal Highness, followed by Ma'am or Sir. As you can see, being a member of the royal family isn't all glitz and glam. There are countless rules, obligations, protocols, and traditions to uphold. What about you? If you had the chance of becoming a royal, would you take it or would you pass? Tell us about it. Also, check out our other cool stuff showing up on screen right now. See you next time.